I would never squat barefoot. And I certainly wouldn't w- walk around the, the gym barefoot by any means because of the disgustingness that's in there. It, look, the gym is dirty. You know what I mean? There's no, I don't care how clean they keep it. The, there's, there's stuff on the floor that's not cool, especially in the locker room. So you better be careful walking around barefoot. And just because Chris Bumstead does it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. RxTelevision, RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. Anything and everything, bodybuilding, non-bodybuilding, diet, training, supplementation, IFBB, pros, news, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the table. Let's go to the questions. The first question on this show from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, Dave, glad you're feeling better. Pre-contest question, I've not, I've heard not to change your normal training just because of your dieting for a show, something that obviously you've suggested a couple of times on the show in the last few weeks. I normally do a, quote, Dorian-type warm-up or two uh, and one working set to fail, followed by a rest pause before cranking out a couple of more reps to fail or incorporate a couple of drops to go past fail. All right, so it's a lot there. Is it okay dieting down, albeit perhaps a few pounds lighter due to dieting or not overtraining while doing cardio two times a day? Yeah. I I think that if you're – doing this type of a workout and getting good, good, good gains out of it. Let's just, let's, I want to preface that. Some people tell me these crazy workouts and and they're not really making, they don't really have good physiques, you know, or they don't really have a lot of muscle development and meaning they're not really necessarily engaging the muscles. Assuming it's working for you off season, you could absolutely do it pre-contest. You you know, obviously you're not going to be a strong pre-contest. You might have to lighten the weight a little bit. Um, you might want to throw an extra one or two sets in there if you feel like you're really not able to go to failure because maybe you just don't have the energy or you don't have the the strength to do it. That's fine. But yeah, I was always a low volume guy. So if I do low volume in the off season, I do low volume pre-contest because if I do high volume, I'm going to lose muscle tissue. So do what works for you. Don't change just because you think, oh, I'm dieting now. I got to do high reps. Well, if you didn't do high reps the whole offseason and you didn't respond well to high reps, why would you do them now? You know, I think that's the mistake people make. Stick to what you do. You might have to modify it a little bit because you're pre-contest now, but I wouldn't make major altercations to what you're doing on a regular basis. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already subscribed there, official underscore RX muscle. Um, if you're not subscribed to this channel, we ask that you do so. Subscribe below, hit the notification bell. If you like what you're watching, we ask that you hit the like button, comment below. Um, we appreciate all of your support helping us to reach the 300,000 mark uh, on YouTube, and we appreciate all of your support throughout the course of the year. Um, Ivan Bodybuilding, what do you think about high-frequency training, doing the exact same volume you would uh, training once a week, only dividing it in half so you train body part twice a week. I know it's something you're not a fan of, but you probably wouldn't suggest this for guys with faster metabolism like yours. But what about us endomorphic bodybuilders with slower metabolism who are not prone to losing weight easily, but also have trouble putting the weight on without getting fat? Yeah, you know, here's the problem. The body can only recover so fast. And you got to remember when you're training like, chest you're also training your triceps okay because you can't get the triceps out of the movement when you're training shoulders you're also training your triceps because you're pushing when you're training back you're also training your biceps and your forearms so there is overlap already now if you do 
each body part twice a week. Now you're doing each body part ostensibly three or four times a week, uh, which is usually too much. So if you're training with high intensity, full range of motion, heavy weights, you should not want to train each body part more than once a week. And if you do, you're probably not doing, you're probably not training intensely enough. And that's what I tell people. When I would finish a leg workout, let's say I did legs on, on a Monday or something like that, or something like that. I think I used to do either Sunday or Monday legs. I don't remember. And when I would be done with that workout, I would be so happy that I didn't have to train my legs again for another whole week because I gave it so much. And I felt so nauseous after the workout. And, I, and my legs were so throbbing from the amount of weight that I lifted and, and, and put on my back that I didn't want to do it anymore. I, I wouldn't want to go back to it. Same thing with chest. If I'm inclining 405 on the incline bench for, for six reps, you think I want to go back and do it again in three days? No freaking way. There's no way my body could recover from that. And there's no way your body can recover from that as well. Just because you have a slow metabolism doesn't mean you should be weight training more because weight training doesn't burn fat, okay? Does it raise your metabolism a little bit? Yeah, but it's not, you're not mobilizing fat. When you weight train, you're using carbohydrates as a fuel source. So you're, you know, if you if you want to do cardio, that's fine because you got a slow metabolism, but don't combine the two together. Don't turn your weight training session into some kind of a, a cardio or metabolic fat burning mission, or you're going to accomplish nothing. You're going to build no muscle and you're not going to lose fat. I promise you. Keep them exclusive. Cardio, separate. Weight training, separate. Never the twain shall meet. <laughs> PMC Dow Fitness. Is DECA as dangerous? I, I guess uh, certain influencers are going about saying uh, it is dangerous. Your thoughts? I look, I use DECA for years. I think DECA is probably one of the safest drugs out there because it doesn't have as many side effects as, as um, testosterone. Now, in some people who use too much of it, they can have a little bit of an erection issue because it can raise prolactin levels, which is something that the 19 nor testosterone um, compounds can do. Trenbolone can do it to a lesser degree, but it's usually dose related. If you take between 200 milligrams and four or 500 milligrams of Decker per week, you get a great joint anti-inflammatory effect from it. It's a really great anabolic combined with testosterone for building muscle and preserving muscle tissue. Uh, and it has virtually zero toxicity in terms of like liver breakdown because it's such a long acting compound. For me, I, I, think, I think DECA, EQ, combined with testosterone, you know, in, in separate mini cycles is probably the best to, to both off season and pre contest drugs you can use. I think it's just, it's safe. They're not toxic. You get nice steady baseline levels of, of the drug in your system where you don't get ups and downs because they're long acting compounds. I don't know why anyone would think it was a bad drug. Like I said, unless you have a real sensitivity to DECA where it just it boosts your, your, your prolactin levels too high and you have erection issues, Aside from those people, I don't know why anyone else would, would say that it's dangerous or that it doesn't work well. Let's go to Benjamin Hamza. Why do so many bodybuilders have type 2 diabetes? Uh, what would you point at? The food, the growth, the growth with or without insulin? Um, because this is a topic that obviously we do get yeah. discussed a lot as far as diabetes management. Yeah. But what would you point the finger at most? You know, we're finding that more and more people are, are having blood sugar control issues because you know why we're finding this? Because, because it's very easy to test your blood sugar nowadays where it wasn't in the past. You can go to Walmart and buy a blood sugar monitor for 10 bucks, you know, and, and you can test your fasting blood sugar in the morning. And if you're over 90, you're, you're high, you know. Now, most people don't do anything because they, they tell the doctor, oh, I'm 95, 96, I'm 100 in the morning. They're like, doctor's like, oh, you're fine. Matter of fact, even in the hospital, they were like, oh, if, as long as you're under 120, you're fine. I'm like, I said, what, what school did you guys go to? Anything over 90 is not good for fasting blood sugars first thing in the morning. And I think in general, the general population, are, are we have high blood sugars. That's why we have so much type 2 diabetes. And, and I think probably 50% is, is induced by our diets and by what we do. And 50% is genetic, which is a lot. That's a lot. A lot of people have just genetic issues. You know, they have blood sugar issues in their family. They hit a certain age and all of a sudden they can't, they can't control their blood sugars. And so 
you know, when we talk about bodybuilders, think about what bodybuilders are doing to their body. Forget the drugs. Forget the fact that growth hormone puts a little strain on the pancreas. Let's get rid of the drugs for a second. What do bodybuilders do? They eat all day long, six, seven, eight meals a day. Think about the load on the pancreas. Every time you eat and raise blood sugar, whether it be because you ate carbohydrates or some of the protein you ate converted into glucose and blood sugar went up in the blood, the pancreas has got to release insulin. For most normal people, they eat three meals a day, right? So you get three big surges of insulin per day, and then you get a surge of insulin at night, right before you wake up in the morning when, you're, when your uh, liver releases a lot of glucose. And then you have like this, what we call basal, like just low-grade insulin release all day long because, because the body's trickling sugar into the blood, okay, from the liver. Now you take a bodybuilder who's eating six, seven times, eight times a day. In my case, I was eating 12 times a day, okay, at one point. Think about how much more insulin the body has to produce now for all those meals the person's eating. And you're doing it every single day. You never miss a day if you're a good bodybuilder. Okay? I don't think Nick Walker missed a meal in six years. I probably have a, a streak, a, a 10 or 12 year streak going. Well, back in the day when I was competing, I never missed a meal. But think about that. That's a huge, huge burden on the pancreas. Now, let's throw some GH on top of that which makes you insulin resistant, which means your body has to produce more insulin to overcome all the GH that's in the system. So what happens is the, pan the pancreas starts burning out and this, the beta cells can't produce enough insulin. And you're asking them to do more and more and more and more, and they just can't keep up. And eventually they get to a point where they're not producing enough insulin at all. And then you're seeing those fasting blood sugars go up in the morning. That's the called first phase insulin failure. So you'll notice the first time you'll start noticing that, that insulin's not working properly is when you wake up in the morning. That's why I always tell people, test your fasting blood sugars in the morning. If they start going over 90 and into close, close, closing in on 100 and higher, that's not good. That means your, your, your beta cells are, are failing. And the best thing to do at that point is, to, is you want to give them a break. And the best way to give them a break is you got to take a long-acting insulin. And people think, oh, I don't want to take a long-acting insulin. I'm going to become dependent on it. Well, you know what? You, you have no problem taking testosterone replacement, okay, if your body can't produce testosterone. So why not take insulin replacement if your body can't produce enough insulin? It's stupid not to. And the great thing is that when you take a long-acting insulin, you're taking the burden off the pancreas. Now now the pancreas can actually rest itself and, the, and regenerate itself. Uh, unlike testosterone production, which is either off or on, insulin production is not is, – is, is always being released, okay? Whether you take insulin or not, you can't shut down insulin production. So, but you could take away the burden of the pancreas having to produce as much insulin because you're helping it out by giving it some extra stuff to work with. And that's the benefit of taking insulin, uh, okay? And that's why as bodybuilders, we should all check our fasting blood sugars and make sure they're 90 or under. If they're not, you might wanna consider, especially in an off-season scenario, taking a long-acting insulin. The great thing also is that Walmart sells long-acting insulin, Novulin N, without a prescription for 25 bucks a bottle. So if you ever, there's no excuse not to be able to get it. You don't need a prescription and it's not expensive. Let's go to Justin D. Abreu. A few months back, I switched from 600 mg to 900 mg uh, test E a week. Started getting really bad acne in my back. I ordered Testalyze to see if it would help with the DHT conversion. Do you think there will be a big difference in growth, recovery, et cetera, between 600 and 900? Um, and or do you think I should taper down? Well, I, I do think that you're going to grow better on, on 900. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> and you're 100% right, by the way. You started breaking out because you're producing higher and higher levels of DHT because as you raise testosterone – more testosterone will convert to other things, estrogen and DHT. You're probably taking a Remedex, which is an estrogen blocker. An estrogen, you know, prevents estrogen from forming. When you do that, more will convert to DHT. So a lot of times when people take aromatase inhibitors like a Remedex, a Femara, a Romacin, they notice that they break out worse if they're prone to it, okay? And uh, that's because they're, they're producing more DHT, in which case you do want to try to take a product like my Testalyze knock down some of the DHT. Usually that helps. If, if it does help and then your acne goes away or it clears up a lot, I, I give it to teenage girls for acne and it works amazing. Then problem solved. If it doesn't, I would recommend going for blood work 
and checking your DHT. If it's through the roof, you might need something stronger like finasteride. Uh, hopefully you don't. Hopefully Testalyze works, and then you can just you can go from there and, and just use that. But 900 is not excessive by any means, and you definitely will get better results muscle-wise from 900 milligrams of testosterone a week than from five. I know you've talked about this in the past as far as uh, incorporating, you know, ab training, you know, with, with your other uh, workouts. Mark Baker wants to know four abs, three main movements to incorporate while training. You know, I don't do a lot. You know, you want to tell here I train my abs. I'll tell you how I train my abs. I actually, at night, um, probably around 10 o'clock, I'll take a break and uh, from if I'm doing emails or whatever, and hopefully I'm done for the night. A lot of times I'm not, but I'll take a break at 10. I'll put the TV on. I put my little AirPods in so that I don't wake the kids up. And I, and I watch a little TV and I'll lay on the floor. On my, I have a little, little carpeted mat and I'll stretch first. And after I'm done stretching, I'll do abs. This is at 10 o'clock at night. And I'll, I'll what I'll do is I'll do crunches. I'll put my legs up. I'll do... I, you know, when I first started, I was doing like sets of 15 or 20 rep crunches because I couldn't do more than that. Now I can do like, I could do probably a, a thousand if I wanted to, but I'll, 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 I usually do 150 crunches in a row, one set, because I can get them all done. Good form. I go back slowly. I control it. I contract. I squeeze. And then I'll do one set of leg lifts with my feet coming six inches off the floor. And I'll do that probably for 75 reps. And I do that every single night, at least five or six times a week. Sometimes I do it every day because I believe in abdominal control. So I'm not excessively training my abs every night, but I'm doing it every day. And what that's doing is it's training my abs to be strong, to support you know, my core uh, without putting excessive weight on there and, and blowing out my abs and making them too big without overtraining them with, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reps. And I find that that works best for me. And I did that most of my career. Less sets, more frequently with abs. And once again, you could do it at the gym after your workout's over. I used to do that too. But now I just, by convention, just do it at night, you know, uh, while I'm watching TV. And I find that that works well. The problem is if you don't train your abs, you have no abdominal control. Um, and, and that's a problem when you get on stage. Uh, not training your abs is not going to make you way smaller, by the way, either. So that's an also a misnomer. I don't train my abs with, and I never have with weights because I think you wind up cheating and using core muscles rather than, uh, and like, you know, psoas muscles rather than the rectus muscles, which is the showy muscles that you want to, you know, really, really work. So don't go too heavy. Try to use body weight, do more, higher reps. I think you're going to get better results. Cody, deal or dial, have you ever heard of someone being allergic uh, to all forms of testosterone? I would normally say no, but I think I have one guy who's always emailing me that every time he takes an injection of anything, he has an allergic reaction. And he's been trying to figure it out for years and, and still, I don't think he, he's really quite figured it out. And I said, look, just you know, stick to oral stuff if, if that's what you really want to take. Uh, I don't know if it's the preservative. I don't know if it's the actual injection itself. I don't know if it's the oil. It, it doesn't make sense. I can't see anyone being allergic to the testosterone molecule because that's what you produce naturally. So uh, it, it's hard to tell what the problem is, but some people do have that problem, yes. Take two, three more questions. Um, <laughs> Duran Big C, does sex count as cardio or should we add more regular cardio? So um doesn't count. Doesn't does count. Not count. No. So they should still do their regular cardio. Yes. Okay, got it. Uh moving on to the next one, the Hinsley high intensity. Um, so you just told us about your ab routine. Can you give us some advice on posing? And I guess the question uh relates to your career. How did you I mean, he says, how did you transition in the mirror routine, being able to nail it with, with without a mirror? So how would you go about posing, practicing posing? And then I guess with or without mirror, how that would impact your uh, posing yeah. training? Yeah. First of all, you have to start posing with a mirror because you have to see what your body position is. And you got to see where your body is in space. And you have to have really good understanding of that. And so I always posed with a mirror in the early stages of posing practice. 
Now, I hated posing practice as much as you guys did. And I wasn't really good at it at first. I was terrible at it. When you're terrible at it, you don't want to practice it even more. Uh, I, I think it was Mike Tyson who said that Customato, who was his mentor, said, "Yeah, um, of the of the things that you don't like to do, do them like you love them." And so, you know, Tyson didn't like going running. He didn't like to run, but he knew he needed to run to have to get good wins. So, what Cus would say would go run like you love running more than anything in your life. And so. I would do that with posing. And what I would do is, and this is how masochistic I am. I would say, all right, when, when do I look the absolute worst? What part of the day? It's obviously the nighttime, right? You're full, but you, you're bloated. You know, you, whole, you, you, know, you ate six meals, you have water in you. And, you know, you look the best really in the morning when you're dried out. So I would pose at night purposely because of that. Because I'd be like, you know what? I want to look the worst I possibly can when I'm posing in this mirror. And I would hate the way I looked in the mirror so bad. And I would be like vomiting at what I look like. But I knew that if I could pose all pumped up and full and, you know, after a whole day of eating, that if I ever put, when I pose all depleted out on stage, it's going to be easy because I'm going to be much lighter and I'm going to look better. And so that's when I would pose. Now, I did have a posing coach for a while, my friend John Naglio. And I used to meet him in, more, in the mornings at a gym and he would go over posing with me when he really, he really taught me a lot about presentation and how to, where my body is in space. And then what I would do is when I would get to a certain point in, in the posing, maybe at like four weeks out or something like that, I would start posing in my head. So I would be just be sitting around and I'd go through the routine and, and all the poses in my head over and over and over again. And then what I would do is I would have someone videotape me and I would just pose with no mirror. But the key is, rehearsing it in your brain you rehearse it in your brain and you know the poses when you start going through them in reality you don't even need to look at yourself because you just know where your body is and you know where it's supposed to be and that only can happen only can happen i have to reiterate that 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 phrase if you practice your posing every day and i know it sucks but you got to pose with someone who's critical of you you can't hang out with your girlfriend and, and she tells you, Oh, you look great, honey. And you go through the same poses every single day, it takes 10 minutes. And then you, all right, you sit on the couch the rest of the night and watch TV because you're so tired. That's not posing. Posing is, is being there with someone who's telling you, Nope, that's wrong. Lift this up, change this page. That's the person you hate their guts, but that's the way you get to get the most benefit out of practice posing. You must correct what you're doing wrong. If you keep reinforcing doing things the wrong way, it's going to become ingrained in you and you're going to do it on stage. It's like trying to teach someone to change their posing like the day before a show. As soon as they get on stage, they're going to go right back to doing it the way they've been practicing it because that's what's in their subconscious. You, In order to change your subconscious, you have to practice, 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 practice doing it the right way. And that's just the reality of the situation. Let's take one more question. Uh, and the Morph Boy Recently, I've seen more and more people squatting without shoes. Is there an advantage to this? I'll add some context to this because I, I, I saw this point being made on a couple of other podcasts as well. Mm -hmm. Chris Bumstead is, I mean, as we know, I mean, forget about having by far the largest following, um, you know, in bodybuilding, perhaps fitness in the world. Mm -hmm. Very influential. And, and what I have seen, Dave, maybe you've seen this as well. You're seeing a lot of the kids wearing, you know, his the, the clothing line that he's sponsored by. You're seeing a lot of the things that he does in the gym. And I think the point was made is that he does that in his videos. And he's walking around barefoot or he's squatting barefoot. Right. And you're seeing a lot of the younger people squatting barefoot. And I think that explains why you have so many people walking around the gym barefoot now. Right, right. Your thoughts on A, being barefoot in the gym, and then B, squatting yeah. while barefoot. First of all, the gym is probably the dirtiest place of all time. If you want to get athletes foot – Walk around the gym barefoot. I'll just say that right off the bat. But let me tell you something. Um, someone once asked me um, about training biceps and how to get big arms. And I said, well, um, and they said, you know, I talked to Flex Wheeler and I talked to Ronnie Coleman and asked them what they do for their arms. And it just doesn't seem to be working for me. I said, well, because, <laughs> because those guys, Ronnie had 20-inch arms before he even started weight training, I said. So don't ask that guy. He was born with those arms, you know. Anything he does builds arms. Same thing Flex Wheel had humongous arms too back in the day. That's not the person you want to 
emulate. You want to take the guy who, who had the worst arms and, and built them. I had always a very long arm and skinny arms, you know, ripped but skinny. And I developed 20, 22 and a half inch arms. I mean, so, and it took a long time to do that. Uh, you know, Vince Taylor probably gave me the best benefit, the best advice on using cable. You know, he said, use cables, do unilateral one arm at a time movements. He said, and if you have a long arm like you do, you're going to, you're going to get benefits out of this. He goes, I'm telling you, use, he says, you could use heavy weight. He goes, just use good form. And you know what? That was the best thing I, uh, you know, the best thing I learned from him, that little trick. And I passed it on to other people and it works great. Now, if you're Lee Priest and you have a really short arm and you, and, and you're also born with great arms, you can do anything and then you're going to grow arms. That's just the way it is. Squatting without a shoe on is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. And I'll explain why. Because if you have a, let's say you have a great arch, uh, and probably Chris Bumstead has a, a great natural arch in his foot, which is probably why he develops muscles so well, because he, he's well, biomechanically well balanced in his body. Okay. So when he gets under a squat bar, whether he's got a shoe on or no shoe on, he's pretty much, his body is aligned properly. But most people don't have a perfect arch. Matter of fact, a lot of bodybuilders have flat feet, no arches. And if you have no arches, instead of sitting like this, you sit like this and, and your feet turn in. That's called pronation. And your knees torque and your lower back torques. And you use all the wrong muscles when you squat. Okay? Even wearing a sneaker or a shoe, a good shoe with good motion control in it, is still – it's better than barefoot, of course – but it still might not be a good thing. And that's why I have all the athletes that I work with and people that just people I give advice to, I have them all go to a podiatrist or a chiropractor and have them get a an custom made pair of orthotics. What that is, it's the insert that goes into the shoe. They custom mold your feet. There's different methods of doing it that they use. And nowadays they can actually scan you with it with an iPhone app. And they send it away to the lab and they make a prescription specifically for your feet to correct your arch deficit. You put them in your sneakers, you wear them all the time, not just when you train, all the time, and you make your feet biomechanically perfect. And when you get under 500 pound squat bar and you have this rigid fiberglass insert in your shoe, which you don't even know is there, and you start squatting, your feet are pushing from a perfect biomechanical standpoint because they the arch cannot give out because there's something rigid under it holding it in place, okay? That's going to perfect your leg training. It's going to prevent you from getting knee pain, back pain, and it's going to give you maximum leg development balanced from front to back, quads to hamstrings to glutes to adductors. That's what you need. If you bear, squat barefoot, okay, for 99% of the population, you're going to either wind up hurting yourself or you're just not going to get the leg development that you want because you cannot maintain a proper arch support in your foot. It's just common sense. Think about it. Even the best arched foot, uh, arched people with five or 600 pounds in their back, their feet are going to start flattening out. It's just impossible to hold an arch under that. And why would you put your foot on that kind of strain? The shoe is almost like protection for your foot. It's like putting a belt around your waist. So take that for what it's worth. I would never squat barefoot. And I certainly wouldn't walk around the, the gym barefoot by any means because of the disgustingness that's in there it, look the gym is dirty you know what i mean there's no i don't care how clean they keep it there's there's stuff on the floor that's not cool especially in the locker room so you better be careful walking around barefoot and just because chris bumstead does it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do it works for him great um arnold used to squat barefoot and arnold's legs were not really that good maybe arnold would have had better legs if he didn't squat barefoot who knows but the majority of people with great legs wear shoes Okay, I'll leave it at that. And that's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. Again, if you haven't already done so, subscribe below, hit the notification bell. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, drop a comment below. And as always, we appreciate all of your support. For Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Farooqui. We'll see you next time.